Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's track on forensic science, a multidisciplinary approach. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Henry Lee. Dr. Lee is one of the world's foremost forensic scientists and his work has made him a landmark in modern day criminal investigations. His testimony figured prominently in the O.G. Simpson trial, among many other police investigations and famous crimes. Dr. Lee is currently the director at the Forensic Research and Training Center and is also a distinguished professor in forensic science at University of New Haven. For a complete biography on Dr. Lee, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Lee's keynote presentation is titled New Concepts in Forensic Investigation. My name is Christy Jewell, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, type in your questions, and click Send. Dr. Lee will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Henry Lee. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Henry Lee. It's an honor and pleasure to lecture to everybody this morning. My topic today is the new concept in forensic science. Forensic science has come a long way, have a long history. The first medical legal autopsy book was published in China in 1248. The modern forensic science would give credit to someone from England. He's the first one introduced a classification system in fingerprint called Henry's system. Even today, some of the countries still using that. That was in 1897. In the United States, the first forensic crime laboratory was established by August Hoover in 1924 in Los Angeles. The next major event in the U.S. forensic class history is in 1924, have a major homicide. It's a robbery homicide in Boston. In 1921, Sacco Vanzetti case. That's the first time introduced the modern firearm identification and comparison. I have the honor in 1985 asked to review what 1921, the laboratory examination by Galvin. Goodell. Um, although I have about 60 years of span, uh, we found the major result is identical. But in 1924, already have a couple of books published about fingerprint. The FBI laboratory was at the, established in 1932 in Washington, D.C. I was entered the forensic field in 1960. And here, I formerly retired from Connecticut State Police Lab in 2010. Over 
these almost 50 years have tremendous changes and events. On the left side of the slide shows 1960s laboratory condition. On the right hand side is when I retired, that time the laboratory condition. As you can see the contrast over the year have tremendous advances in forensic science field. Forensic science service in the United States, currently we have uh, approximately 18,000 law enforcement and police agency. Uh, there's a typo supposed to be law enforcement, not law enforcement. Uh, 2,300 prosecutor's office have 3,000 public defender's office. About 2,400 medical examiner corner office in the United States. Approximately 400 federal, state, local, so-called crime lab or forensic science laboratory employ approximately 1,400 full-time personnel. The technique we use in 1920s psychovanzetti case, basically it's a microscopic examination, use a comparison scope. That's still using today. However, the forensic view from the generalist shift to the specialist. Today, approximately 20 different special disciplines. Forensic pathology, forensic odontology, forensic anthropology, forensic entomology, forensic radiology, forensic nursing, forensic toxicology, forensic psychology, and forensic serology. Some of those areas in the heading, under the heading of forensic medicine, other list as a forensic specialty. The traditional criminalistic services in the forensic lab, including fingerprint, firearm, document, examination, rimpring evidence, trace evidence, serological evidence, DNA evidence, chemical evidence. Of course, today we have a new area of uh, service e crime evidence. Besides that, have drug, arson, bomb investigation. So the criminalistic laboratory basically provide a laboratory testing for those evidence. But at the same time, at the crime scene, also conduct some so-called preliminary testing, screening testing, or uh, the scene reconstruction scene analysis. Today, forensic evidence not only apply to criminal investigation, also commonly used in your civil dispute, public safety, environmental protection, national security, also cases involving historical importance. In addition, many of the time, the laboratory scientists ask to conduct some special tests for consumer protection, product safety, water, food safety, contamination, also medical medication integrity, also involving international domestic terrorism investigation. Uh, once in a while, we're also called upon to building collapse, uh, airplane traffic accident, or bridge rule safety. So today, scientists have gained tremendous power over the outcome of the criminal and civil cases. Myself, have assisted and worked with 46 countries, you investigate about 8,000 some criminal and civil cases. Not too long ago, USA Today 
list 25 events shape the world history. When we look at that 25 event, 14 of those directly, indirectly relate to forensic science. From 9-11, the disaster, terrorist attack, to Iraq war, Krachina disaster, O.J. Simpson case, Clinton case, Oklahoma bombing, Taliban massacre, death of Diana, all those cases, and including many other cases. Some of the case from foreign country and some other cases have historical importance, such as Hokil Kinta, such as investigation of a missing person, Pocahontas. Those cases, forensic laboratory involved also involved in police shooting. Uh, those cases are extremely volatile. Early days, the technique used in forensic investigation in six days, basically interrogation and interrogation got the confession. After the U.S. Supreme Court decision severely limit law enforcement use interrogation technique, so by seven days, what we do is look at the motive, means an opportunity, try to solve those homicide cases. By 80s, we start use psychological profiling, start look at a informer, stink operation, uh, of course, start focusing crime scene profiling. By 1990s, the investigation techniques start shifting witnesses, crime scene analysis, and uh, physical evidence. Now we enter a new era. So forensic investigations start apply big data system, artificial intelligence, expert system, and look at the evidence linkage, panel analysis, uh, geographic analysis. Today, the new investigation concept is look at the six elements from the crime scene to witnesses to public information to look at the physical evidence, data mining, develop the intelligence, use the big data system, use data analytic, artificial intelligence, try to solve the case. In contrast, to the public media or writing, think forensic scientists, we start from the scene to the lab to the core. Actually, it's a three-stage process. The stage one is the crime scene. Documentation recognition of the evidence, collect the evidence, conduct the preliminary testing, usually performed by police or detective or crime scene investigator. Once those evidence collected, tested at the crime scene, submit to the laboratory, that's stage two. The laboratory scientists will do the analysis, the comparison, uh, writing a report, come up a conclusion. The report then submit to the submitting agency can be prosecutor's office, public defender's office, or private attorney. 
or other law enforcement agency, those report will go to court. And subsequently, the forensic scientists will testify in the court. So everything is start from stage one, the crime scene. Crime scene have tremendous information. However, as a forensic scientist and crime scene investigator, we have to recognize those potential evidence. Unless those evidence recognized and collect, preserved, those evidence will never enter the lab or in the courtroom. Crime scene investigation start with a crime scene survey. Forensic scientists will have to assess the situation and communicate with the different law enforcement agency and the laboratory scientists. We have to consider the safety issue, the logistic issue, the legal issue, and uh, of course, the investigative issue. Once the evidence was recognized, then we have to look at the forensic issue. If involving biological weapon or chemical weapon, then security issue become very important. The assignment, whoever in charge the crime scene, have to put the team together and following a standard search procedure. The procedure, which highlight in this slide, is from the response to the scene, to funnel release to the scene. The crime scene issue, we have to consider basically the definition and parameter of the crime scene over the year has changed tremendously. Early days, we think the crime scene just a location or a body. Today, the crime scene has changed the definition. We also have to look at the linkage theory, the hypothesis formation. We also have to address the logic analysis and development of the logic use a multidiscipline approach in investigation. Early days, we usually friend the scene to the lab, collect the evidence, send to the lab. The, the newer concept is to bring the laboratory testing to the crime scene. The crime scene physical pattern have to analyze right away and of course, have to enhance, become more visible. We also have to look at a big data search, artificial intelligence analytic, and uh, of course, look at a crime scene reconstruction. The first thing, the crime scene, early days, we look at uh, just the body. Now, you have to change the concept, they are something called universal crime scene, something called macroscopic and microscopic crime scene. The scene can be as big as the whole Manhattan, as 9-11 demonstrated to us, like Volugia, the whole Everglades is your crime scene. It's no longer just limit of one room or one body. Today, of course, even bigger, the electronic evidence, a person's computer, email, chat room can be a crime scene. And uh, as demonstrate, many cases on the right-hand side, top slide, is globally connected. So a global crime scene you have to consider. Now the last one, the lower right side, the slide shows the microscopic scene. Can be a pen chips, can be a hair, 
can be of important particle. Early days, we at the scene recognized evidence, collect and sent to the lab laboratory. We analyzed them. We searched the database. We issue a report. The newer concept is bring the lab to the scene with all those portable equipment and uh, also with the real-time linkage, we can search the data about those. Document technology also changed tremendously, as shown in this slide. Now we start use 3D and 380 degree camera. The linkage theory is reported by Lacar. Basically, Professor Lacar in early 18th century um, proposed that theory when two things in contact, you have evidence transfer across the border. That worked very well. It's the foundation of the forensic examination of trace evidence. But today, the concept has changed. You don't need physical contact because airborne and uh, so many direct, indirect exchange. So the linkage theory become what we proposed. The crime scene also we have to look at the position, pattern, victim, location, condition, and uh, evidence. Pattern enhancement, you can use photographic contrast to enhance, or use chemical method, or use lighting, side lighting, filtration, physical method, instrumental method, casting, lifting, sequential method. For example, here on um, victim's body, we use combination method, the side lighting, the chemical, and the develop a suspect's fingerprint on victim's skin. Uh, that can be later enhancement with the um, make more contrast, make recognizable, searchable. This still one of the best of the case on imprint evidence. That truck hit the police officer on interstate highway and took off. Police set up a roadblock between Connecticut and New York borderline. We were called to the scene under 160. Usually hit the run case. We look at La Car theory is blood, hair, tissue, fiber exchange. This truck was stopped. No blood, no hair, no tissue was found. However, under 160, have a area looks like something there. After enhancement with chemical fuming, we develop this image as the police officer's shoulder patch. That become a direct link, the image and the officer's uniform. This linkage provide the information, the truck driver hit the police officer. So at the scene, look for information. Information can be from the crime scene suspect, information from the victim, information from the witness, public intelligence, database, record, physical evidence, web analysis, and everything. From the victim, today, not only autopsy, but also victims, trace evidence on the eye socket, full residue between the twos, that can tell us what the victim, his last meal, where 
he was eaten. We also may need time for another record because not every case we can go to the crime scene. So the original documentation, we can analyze that, but the crime scene information can also from the CCTV camera, GPS mapping, cell phone tracking, of course, the future, the real time uh, crime scene analysis. We can look at a motive, financial, love, sex, revenge, a loose political reason, or what's the means, how they enter the scene, how to access the scene, what tool was used, what weapon involved, and uh, how many type of wall, uh, what the transportation, opportunity basically look at uh, the location of the crime scene, the time, timeline analysis, the duration of the crime, the target, the victim. So with all those profiles, you can get the information. Then find the criminal record, enforcement record, firearm, prison record, all those records, you can get the information. Then from the public, you can find a, a web test, you can find a highway a poster, and uh, those basically is the data. Data is different than information. Information is different than intelligence. So what we have to do is collect the data and develop the information. Find information, use linkage theory, develop intelligence. Find intelligence, make assessment, evaluation. Those are knowledge. So the new concept to summarize, is friend the crime scene, we look at the pattern evidence, physical evidence, we look at a witness, suspect, victim, try to use that to develop the per a person. The person can use forensic evidence to identify the person linked to the suspect. Meanwhile, the physical evidence can develop a subject or object to link the subject object together through the database analysis. The forensic evidence, in contrast, the early uh, or the writing seek just the transfer evidence, such as blood, DNA, saliva, semen, fingerprint, shoe print, firearm, but today, the newer concept, the forensic evidence, encompass a larger area, such as transient evidence, pattern evidence, condition evidence, medical evidence, electronic evidence, associated evidence. Now we're going to look at uh, each type of evidence in more detail. Transient evidence which means something can disappear or change as time goes by. For example, when we respond to a crime scene, the odor, the temperature, the color, the body fluid, the condition. For example, a fire on the right top corner. Here, we look at a, a fire scene. You can see five area of origin. From the lower right side, that's dark red. That shows us approximately temperature. It's about 900 some degree. Then next to it, like a cherry, that's cherry red color. Usually reflect that the temperature is hotter, about 120, 100, uh, 1,200 or 1,300 Fahrenheit. 
On top of that, yellowish cherry red is even hotter, approximately 1400 degree Fahrenheit. And the top one is yellowish color, it's even hotter. Once the flame become dazzling white, that usually represent high accelerant. So those basically is a color interpretation. It's not really say exactly degree reflected temperature, but shows the forensic scientists we have a different area, have different type of temperature, and uh, that could be a suspicious fire. The lower left corner shows the serum and the blue cell already separate. That gives forensic scientists a time frame. The lower right shows the blue fly development cycle. So at the scene, if we see eggs or maggots or different stage of maggots or become purple, that give us additional information related to the time spread. Conditional evidence is slightly different than transient evidence. It shows a condition. For example, livability, the lower left side, both are livability, but the coloration shows us different reason. The left side one shows the normal livability. The right side one shows the carbon monoxide poison. The top right corner, the toilet bowl, the seat is lift up. Inside the ball have tissue and urine like material. That's a condition. Give us information. The lower right shows a portion of the victim's body. The blood floating from the thigh and the leg downwards. But between the abdomen and the, the top of the thigh have an area like a blood. That's a condition. Give us information of her body position before or during the blood shake. The pattern evidence, for example, this slide reflect four different patterns. The first one, a vehicle damage pattern can give us an indication the point of a contact. In the left side or right side, front or back. The left lower is a fingerprint on the faucet after use chemical tetramethylbenzidine enhanced. So that shows us that could be a bloody fingerprint and the image of the pattern can be used to search. On the right side, top slide, shows the tool mark. It's not the buy mark. That mark was left by a pair of pliers. Of course, that mark can be used later to comparison. On the right lower portion is a dismembering case. Show some maggot there. In addition, the bone have some weapon mark. Give us indication what type of weapon was used for dismembering. So pattern evidence give us a lot of investigative lead information. Uh, forensic scientists have to able to recognize those, identify those, uh, pass along the information 
to the investigator. The medical evidence can come from autopsy or hospital record. In addition, at the crime scene, the condition of the crime scene, the type of a liquor or one bottle, how many are there can also give us information about the individual living style. The medication also can give us clue. So all those are important evidence we have to discover. Transfer evidence can be blood, a glue, adhesive material, hair, fibers. Electronic evidence can be digital image, digital voice, photographic image, voice recording, text message, email. All those can be important for investigation. In addition, there are something called associative evidence, for example, caller ID, the barcode, van number, license number, ID card, or amount of cash, all those can provide us information. Examination of a physical evidence star in the laboratory, usually those evidence is collected and submitted to the laboratory. In the laboratory, we commonly use physical method, microscopic examination, biological technique, immunological technique, medical technique, psychological, chemical, toxicological, and instrumental analysis. Laboratory examination usually involves physical evidence. Physical evidence, some uh, evidence already exam at the crime scene or already exam by other laboratory. Or physical evidence was directly submitted by the police department without examination. So in the laboratory, we have to able to distinguish that. And the laboratory is star from the preliminary examination document of the evidence. The evidence, once it's document, then we can use most uh, basic examination first such as physical matching, visual examination, exam the evidence under the lie sources. After that, then we do so-called confirmation test. This slide shows an example, the procedure for biological testing. At the scene, usually we do early days called presumptive field tests. Now, of course, use a different terminology called screening field test or chemical field test to identify the body fluid, whether or not a stain is consistent as a semen stain or body fluid or blood. Once submitted to the laboratory, they do a confirmation test, such as crystal test, immunological test, species test. Early days, individualization start with ABO, isoenza, serum protein. But today, is directly conducted DNA analysis. At the scene, we also do so-called preliminary reconstruction. For example, the bullet trajectory. For example, the blood stain pattern or gunshot residue analysis. 
In the laboratory, we do presumptive screening tests. We do species tests, also confirmation tests. From that, early days we do a PEGM, ABO, then serum protein. Those before 1980. By 1989, when DNA introduced to the field, so by 90s, we start moving to DNA. The first generation of DNA is RFLP, then moved to PCR. Today, we use STR technique. STR technique is much more sensitive, uh, require much less sample. RFLP need more fresh and uh, large amount of a sample. STR, of course, today, all the laboratory follow the standard CODIS core requirements of loci. Early days star, 13 loci, and today some laboratory even move into 26 different loci. In addition, the DNA data bank and uh, the have uh, uh, besides DNA also have fingerprint, also have firearm, all those can be used also, next generation DNA has been introduced too. Um, so DNA now not only can give us information, identify an individual or eliminate an individual. The DNA also can assist the investigator, look at the physical characteristics such as hair, eye, skin color, um, the recent report even moved into the familial DNA search, the family members. Rapid DNA also introduced the view for the quick analysis. So DNA has become the major uh, piece of evidence in the modern forensic laboratory. However, DNA also face some issues is the mixture of DNA, how to interpret those mixture DNA. Today, because the time limit, we're not going to address that. Besides DNA, fingerprint also have a lot of new technology, new chemicals can be used to develop latent print at the scene. The fingerprint field also use lasers, portable light sources, equipments. Laboratory automation from 1986 to today, we have tremendous advances, we have a tremendous database set up too. 3D examination of physical evidence or medical evidence has been also introduced a few. Database from FS fingerprint now moved to IFS, uh, of course, to next generation of identification. Next generation of identification is basically it's a biometric database, not only use fingerprint DNA, but also use the eye color and the retina and uh, other identification. So today, the data machine mining is getting bigger and bigger and more and more, in addition to close data information also have open source from computer file, purse phone records, and uh, website, and uh, 
or those records can be used in a data analytic fashion to link a incident to a developed suspect. To summarize that, the utilize of forensic evidence is from the C, the C analysis, screening test, collect information, collect evidence, then send to the laboratory. Laboratory do instrumental biological confirmation test, then submit to the coral. So DN utilize of forensic evidence, we have to be absolutely objective. Anything associated with suspect will have to recognize, to identify, to analyze it. But anything dissociated of the suspect evidence, we should also equally analyze, recognize, and report it out. Anything proof or disproof a statement, we should report objectively and uh, faithfully. Any inculpatory evidence or exculpatory evidence, a forensic scientist will have to put equal amount of uh, effort to examine, to report. So any material can be identified or individualized. Any confirmation or any information developed of lead, we should utilize that too. Unfortunately, the utilization of forensic evidence is not up to the forensic scientist or forensic laboratory. Many times, the crime scene is conducted by the police. Whatever the evidence they submit to the laboratory, we only saw those evidence. When the report issued to the coroner, not all the evidence is introduced. The introduced evidence is by the prosecutor or defense attorney. We only can testify on those evidence introduced. Even the forensic scientists are objective and faithful, totally independent, but once get to the coroner, the same testimony, if you are testifying for prosecution, the defense always call us a biased witnesses. If you testify for defense, prosecution always address us hired gun. Therefore, the standard not only should set up for the forensic scientists, also for the lawyer. In 2009, National Academy of Science issued a white paper, so-called NAS report, on the strength of forensic science in the United States. In that report, it criticized the traditional forensic evidence, such as fire scene pattern, physical matching, fingerprint, uh, ballistic evidence. However, this report is only addressed to the positive identification. Every day in a forensic laboratory, we do elimination, submit the evidence. For example, here, a shoe print was found in a homicide scene on a piece of paper. The suspect sneaker was submitted. Uh, we quickly eliminate that. It's not the sneaker deposit that shoe print. However, if a so-called early days called matching, now we say consistent with, say how many points you declare a match or consistent. 
that involving more statistical calculation. That's why the traditional forensic identification, such as fingerprint, palm print, bullet casing, tool mark, shoe print, foot print, dental mark, by mark, lip print, ear print, handwriting, signature, even autopsy, is that a true identification or just a similar consistent ways. Many laboratory under this attack. So several years later, the president's scientific council issued another report on criticized forensic field. A lot of good things happened because of the report and more and more standard uh, organization set up to look at uh, address those issues. Many committees, including uh, NIST, set up a OSAC subcommittee to address those standard issues. Those are excellent and positive move in the forensic field. In addition, proficiency tests, laboratory accreditation uh, made a lot of positive mo move and improved the forensic identification. However, the criminal justice system put a lot of pressure in the forensic area. The future of forensic science, the application, police start looking at the investigative move more than the forensic evidence. Forensic scientists from the early leading role now become supporting role. More and more, they based on the surveillance camera or artificial intelligence database search. Forensic scientists also under scrutiny a lot of pressure between law and science. Because not all the scientific evidence are black and white and clear cut. The majority of evidence is in the gray area. So the forensic scientists will have to understand what is logic, conclusion, what is common sense, what is opinion, what is just pure speculation. To give an example, this is a homicide scene. A victim was stabbed 18 times. The crime scene pattern shows us a clean, clean up attempt by the suspect. However, that pattern, you cannot really say collect the pattern, send to the laboratory to give the statistical information what clean up means. The pattern is observed as the slide depict shows a map clean. In addition, the blue stamp pattern shows us very little blue stamp was found on the lower portion of her body. That indicative the victim more likely was stabbing occur when she was already on the ground. The crime scene screening test identified some of the blood stain are in fact blood. In addition, with the chemical enhancement, with orthotolidine, we was able to develop 
a partial shoe print. This shows in this slide the D location. A close up of that slide illustrates the pattern. This information was given to the investigator right away. Uh, they were able to locate a sneaker at the garbage can. So the comparison of the sneaker and uh, the shoe print at the scene, you cannot really match them because that's at different surfaces. Also, it's a portion shoe print. The conclusion we can say it's consistent with as depict in this slide. On the left side is the shoe. On the right side is the sneaker. On the shoe, there are hairs. Hairs from the microscopic characteristics can indicate the race, but we cannot really say Michael Spock uh, said matching the hair, only can say similar. The blood stain was found on the sneaker. That we can do traditional ABO or isoenza, but because the advances in forensic, we did the so-called DQR prop DNA, With that kind of result, you may link a suspect to a crime. But forensic scientists will never testify the suspect is the one murdered the victim. However, with the pressure from prosecution, defense, court, judge, the ethics standard, the media, the family, and police constantly forensic forensic scientists is under pressure. That's why we need high integrity, ethic standard, scientific standard, procedure standard. Recently have a case happened thirty years ago. A victim was murdered. However, the media have an article say this case inaccurate testimony lead to wrongful conviction. However, when we review the transcript, review the case, in 1980, in a laboratory, nobody used glove because that time, no DNA. The evidence sent to the laboratory or the crime scene, for example, the sneaker on the top left have some blood. We usually remove that from the sneaker. After remove, you don't see the blood anymore. Next slide depicts some of the evidence. Early days, the technology is cut the piece and remove that to do analysis. For example, a recent commercial uh, photo showed on the left side say how to collect the evidence, DNA evidence, we say swap. Um, the left hand side wear a glove, the right hand side did not wear the glove. After you use a swap, remove everything from the cell phone, the DNA already removed. Next day or 30 years later, you retest the cell phone. You're not found the original DNA. You found whoever demonstrate the collections DNA. So with that, what the newspaper or the court paper says what we did 30 years ago and uh, what today 
is complete different. You cannot say, today you did not find blood, them 30 years ago, blood wasn't there. In addition, the case was solved not because the blood stamp found on a sneaker. It's the victim's credit card found in the suspect's home. So in summary of my talk, the forensic scientists always under stress. But the, whatever we do, we have to obey the standard, stick with the standard, the scientific, legal, procedure, technical, uh, ethics standard. Whatever we do, we should not lower your standard. That should haul the truth to the lawyers, police, uh, everything, everybody. We should not lower our standard. I want to thank you very much uh, for listening to my lecture today. Also, I want to share with the viewer of this lecture, be a winner. You have to have knowledge in your mind, have courage in your body, have honesty in your heart, and have brain in your life. If you have any question, you can through the website, send me a, inform, a question, I will try to answer those. And once again, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank Labyrinths for making today's educational webcast possible. As a final reminder, Dr. Lee will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. We thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Goodbye.